For everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, Surf's Up, Season 2, Episode 63, the second of our three-part end-of-the-year series, starts now. Today on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. Even within patients who have cirrhosis, there are rapid progressors, there are slow progressors, there are going to be non-progressors who will live and die with cirrhosis and not of cirrhosis and have a, a different clinical outcome. And until we stratify these folks to define what their natural history and outcomes will be, we will be challenged in trying to tailor a one-size-fits-all approach. Your liver is really your mirror of your metabolic health. So it's your mirror. If you are leaner obese but have fat in the liver it's just telling you your insulin resistance and unhealthy metabolically it could be your genes we can blame our parents as we like to do or it could be poor dietary habits or lack of physical activity cetosis is a great marker of future bad things to happen there should be a societal commitment to improve metabolic health to talk about education at schools nutritional education and that kind of goes the same way that we discussed with Jeff Lazarus on this podcast to implement a more broad concept of living healthy where people then can go on to lead a life that supports liver health. As 2021 comes to a close, Surfing the Nash Tsunami has invited back nine panelists from earlier in the year to look back on specific lessons and advances in NAFLD and Nash over the past year. On today's podcast, join liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell and pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green as they interview professors Manal Abdelmalik, Jörn Schottenberg, and Ken Kuzi on areas where they saw progress over the year. Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. Welcome to the second part of our three-episode end-of-year wrap-up. This wrap-up includes interviews with nine of the key opinion leaders and newsmakers who've appeared on our podcast throughout the year. Yesterday, I talked about all the things we have to be thankful for in this podcast, so today I'm just going to dive into what are we doing. First, Manal Abdelmalik is going to join us, and she's going to talk about drugs, old drugs, and drug development during the year, and what the future looks like in terms of pharmacotherapy and where we're headed. Second, Ken Cousy will join us to talk about the clinical care pathway and multi-specialty work he's done during the year and who he's worked with and what kind of precedent that sets going forward to improve care for the majority of early stage patients. Finally, Jorn Schottenberg will join us and he'll be talking about a variety of trends in Europe centered originally around health economics and winding up spending more time talking about patient quality of life and different ways to talk about successful patient therapy. As I say, these are only excerpts of the conversation. We will be dropping the full conversations over the next three days after this episode. At the end, we'll give you the schedule for that. I hope you enjoy. First, Professor Manal Abdelmalik of Duke University will discuss use of old drugs and new drug development in NASH and NASH cirrhosis over the past year. So this morning, and it's morning in the States afternoon in England, we're here with our friend Manal Abdelmalik, who's been with us on the podcast several times this year. Manal, how are you this morning? Oh, good morning, Roger. How are you? I'm fine. It's a little chilly in Pennsylvania. How's it doing in North Carolina? A little chilly, but we got beautiful sunny weather this morning, so I'm all, I'm good. It's good. And Louise, good afternoon. How are you today? Good afternoon. It's dull here and it's chilly. <laughs> for the weather forecast. Yeah, I think it's admirable the way the Brits can laugh about that kind of weather daily. At any rate, so, so this is the fourth, I think, in our series of ongoing converse, end of year conversations with friends of the podcast, where we're taking a look at different things that we've learned in 2021. We haven't prepared for these, which is kind of talking. We invited Manal to join us today. She came on podcast back in a really well listened to episode. And in fact, her personal conversation was also highly uh, downloaded on the question of what can we do today with older drugs, older medications that are available, and then to lay that up against what do we see coming in the next couple of years, and how will all that fit together to the degree it will, as compared to a simple transition from A to B, is I think really a great topic for today. So, Manal, I can ask you two questions to get started, and then floor is yours. Have fun with it. You talked both in this podcast and in one of the talks that you gave, I believe, at ASLD, about the idea that, particularly for cirrhotic patients, the idea that we do not have new indicated drugs 
drugs means that we can throw up our hands and say there is no drug therapy. Can you remind us a little bit of what it was that led you to realize that that issue was as urgent as it was? I think you talked on the podcast about a talk you gave where someone asked a question. And then where you see that today in terms of what the things we can be doing for cirrhotic patients and, and should be doing? Well, you know, the, the cirrhotic patient cohort is one in absolute need. I mean, this is a huge urgency, emergency. And I think if you talk to any hepatologist, they'll resonate the message that we are seeing more and more of our patients transition to cirrhosis, more patients in need for liver transplantation, and a higher incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma that I am experiencing now in my clinical practice than I recall 20 years ago. And when we talk about this epidemic, we're certainly seeing a larger driver of it be attributable to NAFL to NASH. So it speaks to the huge unmet need for therapies in this space. I had given a talk in reflecting about what the ideal treatment for NAFL to NASH is for cirrhosis. And it's really one that I believe one size will not fit all. Ultimately, the goal for my patients with cirrhosis is, is frankly, you get to a point where you realize that reversing 20, 30, 40 years of chronic injury is not going to be achievable. It's not going to be achievable in one year, two years, maybe even three or five years. The goal of reversing hepatic fibrosis may not be one that is readily tangible with the current endpoints that we have in the context of ongoing clinical trials. If we approach the cirrhotic cohort such that we blunt a metabolic driver of disease and also combine that with a, a therapy that will attenuate the fibrogenic response to a metabolic driver, we can potentially keep patients stable. There is data that if you improve diabetes or you induce weight loss or you even manage the metabolic syndrome effectively, there is emerging data that just blunting metabolic drivers with therapies such as insulin sensitizing agents, statins, ACE inhibitors can potentially minimize or the risk of cirrhosis, cancer, and hepatic decompensation can even improve portal pressure. With that being said, if we were to take this cohort of patients with cirrhosis and even maintain stability by optimizing their metabolic drivers and potentially combining it with therapies that at the very least the data suggests that they attenuate fibrosis progression, maybe not complete regression, that would be a win because then we take a large cohort at risk and prevent the risk of decompensation. Now, with longer term studies, we may see that more sensitive surrogate markers of disease are showing evidence of fibrogenic repair, but we're not quite there yet. You know, our, our endpoints with histology are amazingly crude. They're insensitive. We have evidence emerging that other surrogate markers of disease, whether it be MR elastography, uh, a VCTE, or even ELF score, are informing these uh, clinically meaningful outcomes. And so I think these pathways of therapy and biomarker discovery are right now in parallel with each other. And I'm hopeful in the upcoming coming year or two that they will collide, that they can inform each other more so than they are doing now because they'll be more broadly validated in the context of therapeutic trials. But I think cirrhosis will be either a drug that, that wows us with its effect on metabolism, inflammation, and fibrosis, or combining therapies together such that we can attenuate these drivers and, and hope that we maintain stability, at least in the early early treatment endpoints and with longer clinical trials that move into phase three, then see the downstream effect on, on um, minimizing hepatic decompensation. So one of the ideas in there that you didn't hear a lot about two years ago, but you hear a bunch about now, is the idea that we don't necessarily have to focus on a one-level reduction in fibrosis, but uh, there are situations, this being one, but not the only one, where stasis is probably a good enough goal from where, in your mind, did that school of thinking start to emerge? It, it started to emerge in my clinical practice, even within the spectrum of cirrhosis, there's a heterogeneity. There are patients that I see who have cirrhosis that remain stable for a decade, and others that I see that have cirrhosis that develop tumors but don't get hepatic decompensation as their first manifestation, and others that I may see that look incredibly well compensated and six months to a year from now are awaiting transplantation. Our clinical experience speaks to the heterogeneity within cirrhosis 
in so much that it speaks to the heterogeneity that we're challenged with within NASH. This is where we will learn more in the upcoming year because clearly we're starting to see genetic risk factors that are informing these endpoints. And we will discover that even within patients who have cirrhosis, there are rapid progressors, there are slow progressors, there are going to be non-progressors who will live and die with cirrhosis and not of cirrhosis and have a, a different clinical outcome. And until we stratify these folks to define what their natural history and outcomes will be, we will be challenged in trying to tailor a one-size-fits-all approach to the treatment, not only of NASH, but of, of cirrhosis. I'm hopeful that our understanding of genomics, genetics, and integrative omics approaches can not only define who needs treatment because they will progress, Number two, define potential treatment responses. But number three, also call out in advance the natural history of the course that they will have such that we can monitor patients in a more tailored approach. We know in advance who's likely to develop the cancer and we surveil them differently than we anticipate patients who will develop different clinical outcomes. And with that knowledge, I think we will move in a more cost-effective therapeutic strategy as well as preventative strategy. We're not there yet. We still treat all patients irrespective of their risk and irrespective of their drivers and irrespective of their genomic profiling the same. With that, we are insensitive. We miss cancers. We are surprised with natural histories for those that don't progress and we anticipated could and, and those that do when we anticipated wouldn't. So the measures we have currently, whether they're imaging or liver chemistries or markers of liver synthetic reserve, are not as precise as we need them to be. And I am excited about the forefront of precision medicine coming into the landscape of liver disease such that we can stratify patients precisely on many different fronts. Louise, you have a question? No, I have a question because my brain was going on that tangent uh, on precision medicine because I did a couple of the sessions at the recent AASLD meeting and it was very much on HCC and picking the right people for HCC. What if we take all of the cl current clinical studies in cirrhosis, in any liver disease format, they all store samples, for example. What is different that would, in a sample collection that would require for proteinomics? If everybody combined their entire cirrhosis portfolios together and took a sample and did a, a mass study on all of the cirrhotics for this precision medicine, rather than re-recruit, what would be the obstacles, because I'm just thinking that the recent Lancet Commission suggested even in viral hepatitis, the delay of COVID could mean an extra 45,000 HCCs and more than that, new people with cirrhosis. We obviously, Stephen's studies also showed that although numbers didn't necessarily increase, the amount of cirrhotics and decompensated cirrhotics did between the two cohorts 10 years apart. So action now to be able to pick out and combine that resource that is massive when we look at all of those studies that we've got in whether it's alcohol, whether it's NASH, uh, whether it's hep C, whether it's so that we can look at those, what would be required? Would it be an extra sample? Is, is there anything that they're saving that we couldn't, that we would need extra to make it more complicated? Well, Louise, I, I think we're getting there. We have you know, the Nimble Consortium. We have the Litmus Consortium. We have now data from the Million Veterans Projects. We have certainly ample ongoing clinical studies. And assuming we can overcome the logistics of data sharing and material management across different sponsors and with initiatives that there is ample opportunity. And I think we are seeing far more robustly powered data in this regard from these large consortia. So I am very encouraged that we are going to get there. I think one very telling story that unfolded in this past year with our promising compounds for the treatment of NAFL to NASH is the many missed primary endpoints. A few that gave you pause, particularly, for example, Alda Furman or Begpal Furman or, or others that, that have failed to achieve an endpoint where all least accumulated preclinical and clinical data would otherwise have informed such an endpoint having been achieved. And a message out there, I'm hopeful that we can shelf some of these compounds 
as opposed to pitch them. Because when the promising therapies have an effect on liver biochemistry and quantitative liver fat and liver stiffness and surrogate markers of fibrogenesis and drop pro C3 and every marker that you could think to inform fat, necroinflammation, and even fibrosis, we see the needle moving in a positive direction and yet miss the endpoint on histology. And we call this a failed study. I suspect we'll come full circle and hopefully be reevaluating these compounds in an era where the field has moved forward enough that our endpoints have either changed or are more sensitive or the precision medicine field can define which cohort of patients is going to respond most effectively to what drug target. And I certainly hope that the message resonates that we've probably studied some very effective therapies for the treatment of NASH, but applied them to a very heterogeneous cohort of patients and blunted a treatment response that was there given the sample sizes, or the endpoints which we've utilized to measure a treatment response were so crude or insensitive that the response was there, but we could not observe it with the endpoints we used to measure it and therefore called it a failed trial. So for those compounds that have significant promise, validity scientifically, and evidence to have worked on other surrogates, I'm hopeful we will shelf them as opposed to trash them such that we can look at them in combination approaches or re- repeat some of the studies using different endpoints and different technologies to inform a treatment response in the future. So it's interesting. You mentioned aldefermin and pegbelfermin as two examples of what you're talking about. And I think it's clear, if you think about the aldefermin trial, right, histology read missed on one of the dose levels and everything else aligned. Pegbelfermin, it didn't necessarily look like anything held value out to 48 weeks. So it's easy to figure out why you would have belief in the first. Right. Harder to figure out why you'd have belief in the second. So what are you thinking there? Or are you well, just... I, I think when I when I use Peg Belfermin as an example, I think of it as the class. We talk about FGF21, and it speaks to the fact that not all drugs are created equally even within class. When we talk about a target such as FGF21 or FGF19, pegylation, and target engagement, bioavailability, distribution, autoantibodies that may or may not develop, and how those impact treatment, we should be evaluating each drug, not as a class, but as an individual standalone therapy and its effectiveness. So because one one therapy may not have worked within class does not necessarily mean that every drug within class may be not as effective. Within the FGF21 uh, class, we have a Fruxifermin, for example, that shows some potent efficacy. We have different therapies within the FXR class that show hold promise. We're seeing many therapies within the GLP-1 receptor class. So the nice part about the field is there are many potential targets within the same class, many compounds, I should say, to engage the target within the same class. So what will be interesting is to see how they individually perform as a compound within a class, because ultimately, as we saw with the diabetes or with other therapies, even statins, you may have multiple different agents within a class, but different efficacies, different tolerability profiles, and maybe different patients who who are in need of a therapy or, or a drug target that will respond or tolerate a certain drug better than another. So how many statins do we need on the market. We have several, but yet they are tailored in their prescribing and their effect and their tolerance to certain patients. And I think the same story is going to unfold. You're talking to somebody who bombed Pravacol on liver enzymes, stayed away from statins for 10 years as a result, and then came back to resuvastatin and did really well. So I am the case that makes your point, actually, on this one. I think that sounds exactly right. Louise, go ahead. No, I agree with everything I'm says, and I'm repeatedly saying exactly the same. It's stabilization is a, an endpoint. If um, Donna would be key on this and any of the patient advocates that have had um, disease, they don't want to progress. They're happy to stay stable and well if we can keep you stable and well and I think Manal did an excellent session on what toys in the armory for medications that you've got with your diabetic populations what you've you've got currently that you can use in primary care or specialist care to keep people stable because we do cirrhosis episodes and they're often the top ones we can even do cirrhosis tsunami because that is coming with the amount of diagnosis late and it needs to be addressed and Manal's completely correct 
from a patient advocacy point of view, from anything, one of the reasons that I left the NHS was to try and enable early diagnosis in a more routine, cost-effective, high-volume way, because it's the only way to see it. I got to the end of watching people die young of a disease that we can screen for, we can educate about, and parents miss their children going up. People miss their daughter's weddings or their children's weddings or the birth of their first grandchild. These things are avoidable in the majority of liver health. With COVID really, really delaying diagnosis, people into hospital, picking out vulnerable communities and metabolic disease, of which this is one of them, the Lancet Commission lays it out very stark as to what is happening and what could be happening and what will happen. And we're not in a position to turn turn it around without large scale location of disease. And I think so Manal's perfect. We've got to keep the cirrhotics we've got stable because we've got more cirrhotics coming and we need to be able to stabilise those as early as possible. But we also need to find pre-cirrhotic, so Ishak 5, 4, 3, so things like that to locate these people earlier. But we also need to get them to ask the question and say, check my liver, please. Along what Louise is saying, when we take a look at the timeline to a potential drug that's going to be approved for NASH, we have obiticolic acid currently under FDA review, and we have rismeteron, aramacol, and others kind of in, in, you know, phase three now. But but the earliest that I foresee any drug approval really being broadly embraced or utilized in post, post-approval is really on a horizon in my scope at the earliest of two to five years, two being the very earliest, but probably even a little bit pushed beyond that. When you talk about the integration with third-party payers and distribution and prescribing and so forth. In the meantime, we really must empower our primary care physicians and non-hepatology colleagues in this space with knowledge, with the tools for risk stratification, and with treatment algorithms that may temporize disease progression such that we can do a service now pending an approval of a drug. I've been in this space since the first trials were done and and I'm still talking about a treatment becoming available for the therapy of NAFLD and NASH 23 years later. So I think we must mobilize in the spirit of patient advocacy, rendering the general practitioner, the community physician, the family doctor, the endocrinologist, the obesity specialist, the knowledge, the tools, and the comfort by which to treat each and every metabolic risk factor, knowledge of what the clinical data would otherwise say about about minimizing metabolic risk, about weight loss, about treatment of lipids, about improvement of glycemic control, about management of sleep apnea, about comfort and ease with prescribing statins despite the presence of elevated liver enzymes in patients with NAFLD and NASH. We still have a lot of work on that front that needs to be done. And so at least for the, the largest population who is not yet seeing a hepatologist, doctors have an algorithm and a comfort by which they can utilize existing tools and therapies at their disposal. Next, Professor Ken Cousy of the University of Florida will discuss progress in multidisciplinary coordination against the NASH pandemic leading to the Critical Care Pathways paper later in the year. Okay, so we're back now with our good friend, Ken Cousy, who's been with us for a couple episodes in the past year, and I think a couple of conferences as well. Ken, how are you today? How are you, Roger? Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining. I'm doing fantastic. This is, as Louise has reminded me, our third out of five today. Louise, how are you? I'm doing very well. I'm looking forward to what Ken's got to tell us. Uh, I, I, and I as well. So, Ken, as I think we've discussed, this series of interviews is about major things that have happened in fatty liver in 2021 and what they portend for the the future. And certainly one of those has been the multi-specialty effort in the U.S. to coalesce around the need to treat and a process for treating the disease. And you've been certainly up to your keyboard in that. And I think well beyond your keyboard, probably to your shoulders or neck as well. So let's start by talking a little bit about the progress that was made in 2021 and what kind of feedback you're getting from the broader communities right now about the work. Well, Roger, that's a great question. It's a broad question. And I think we only have a little bit of time here. But again, there has been a much 
much greater awareness this year beyond the liver field and hepatology trends that is based on new data this year from the United States and, and abroad that shows that fatty liver disease and the risk of cirrhosis from NASH is a real thing. I still have peer endocrinologists say, hey, I never had anyone with ascites come to my clinic. And the reality is that that is slowly changing. The studies that our group and others did using enhanced data, you know, the big national survey that assesses many health outcomes, says that about two out of three people with type 2 diabetes and probably a close number of those with obesity without diabetes have NAFLD and maybe one in five or one in six have significant fibrosis. So these numbers are beginning to not only get the attention of primary care doctors, but everybody who manages chronic diseases like obesity and diabetes. I think that that was several decades ago with cholesterol awareness. I mean, it doesn't happen overnight. It's something that builds momentum and momentum is building because different societies like uh, in the endocrine field, in primary care, in obesity, like the Obesity Society, at least in the United States, are coming together and we discuss in other podcasts the clinical care pathway. Not only that, but also at an international level, the efforts that we did in this simultaneous publication in Diabetes Care, which is the official journal of the ADA, in Gastroenterology, which is the official journal of the American Gastroenterological Association, also was published in Obesity, the, the official journal of the Obesity Society. These are big journals that are saying, hey, we have a problem. And there were international leaders there. The other effort is the effort that done across the ocean led by Jeff Lazarus and Wilton Park. And he has gathered really a fully international community of leaders and all kinds of not only liver experts, diabetes experts, primary care. And they have published a couple of nice reviews this year and one in Nature reviews, highlighting the gaps and bringing awareness. So I'm very excited. And there are some guidelines coming in 2022. And there have been new drugs that have been successful. We've had also some failures. So as life, you know, a mixture of good and bad. So Ken, I should mention that when Jeff was on talking about the public health agenda paper, he cited the clinical care pathways work that you've done in the U.S. as one of the really um, exciting and remarkable events of 2021. So, Oh, great. I, di I didn't know that. So I'm so excited now. Thank you. Ken and I were at the Les Wilton Park. Actually, I watched Ken present at the Les Wilton Park event. Exactly. Where he said he had five minutes to prevent, ran in, presented for five minutes, and went back to whatever else he was doing. He's a busy guy. So that's the foundation, right? Part of the foundation is the work that, that Jeff is doing with the with uh, Easel and the Wilton Park folks. Part of the foundation is the work you're talking about here in the States. So what do you see in 22? 2022 is going to be a great year, I think. Number one, I can tell you, for example, the on the liver, my friends, the hepatologists are updating the AASLD guidelines, the guidelines of the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases. So that's going to be out in, I suspect, early 2022. And they will incorporate some progress made in the diagnosis and treatment of NASH from the endocrine. And I can tell you that the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. There are two big endocrine groups. That's one, and the other is the Endocrine Society. Well, ACE is going to release guidelines in January. The first guidelines for endocrinologists complementing the work of ASLD, and we have a couple of members of the ASLD committee, Dr. Rinella and Dr. Yonusi, who were very instrumental in giving their worldwide recognition as experts in the field. So that's coming out. I'm talking with the American Diabetes Association to update the ADA guidelines. The ADA guidelines was very bold in 2019 to recognize the need to screen. Although the current recommendations are to seek for fibrosis only if you have fat in the liver or elevated liver enzymes. A minority of people have elevated liver enzymes, so that's not sufficient. So the work that we are doing currently is more along the line that everybody get a FIB4, which is the calculation from age, liver enzymes, and platelets to try to identify, to rule out people with cirrhosis at least. So I think the ADA is going to be moving forward. And I'm very excited as also the work of Jeff and colleagues is, is moving forward with advancing the awareness among this. And I also know that phase three studies are starting with drugs that have proven to be effective in 2021, like semaglutide and lanifibrinor. So there are good things that are happening. And again, there's also a broad 
spectrum of other agents that are moving forward, although we had some setbacks, as you know, from the ASLD meeting. This is a kind of an inside ball track question. You mentioned SEMA and LANI and not resmeterone. Is that just because you weren't thinking of resmeterone, or is there a way in which you think of it as being different from the other two? Well, resmeterone has promising results. It may make it more liver specific, why the field of uh, outside the liver field are excited about the other two compounds is because they have so significant uh, cardiometabolic effects on diabetes, on the probably cardiovascular risk, and major effects possibly on some of the lipid fractions, which the resmeterone has some. And again, the effect on steatopatitis was larger with both compounds compared to the madrigal compound. This is going to be a multi-pharmacy kind of, one agent alone is not going to get the job done for most patients. Okay, that sounds right. So good news on drugs, good news on organization moving forward. Louise, what questions do you have before I keep going? I think the AGA pathway has been phenomenal in the context that it's easy to follow. It's very directive and it's actually hard to get it wrong. And if in doubt, just follow it. That, to me, makes it very applicable to primary care. A lot of the strength of Ken's work and Jeff's work and Wilton Park and all of the establishments is it's collaborative. It is throughout the disciplines because we do need to work together. There was a letter to the government here last week by a lot of major food industry worth over £3.8 trillion, for example, asking for food labelling to improve to help society. So we're also now seeing, and certainly Jeff's work and the last that recently it was about collaboration and we cannot do it just the medical world it has to be a societal thing Ken's work with that side bringing it together making it easy from a primary care perspective I can implement it as a nurse specialist as an advanced practitioner I can look at how we can support primary care implementation of secondary care diet groups weight management weight loss management how we can work collaboratively those are the strengths of what Ken's described and what Jeff has described that to me is the exciting part of 2021 then we add the medications then we add let's get people's awareness up about poor liver health because you should never really get liver disease if we target poor liver health earlier or necessarily diabetes they are aligning and it is through this great work so i'm just excited to hear what ken's got next (laughs) up his sleeve yes we've got these new guidelines coming up where do you see two or three years from now because the movement is now gathering traction well that's a great question louise i remember the first time i said we have to screen people with diabetes in the same way we do for retina or nephropathy was a review in 2008 for an ADA journal, but not much happened for the next 10 years. And I think we've made more progress in the past 12 months than in the past 10 or 12 years before. And that is because things kind of gather a momentum. And I think the momentum is now. And what I think is going to happen now is that there's going to be a convergence of awareness. People are going to begin using the FIB4, particularly if the American Diabetes Association gets on board. And this is going to coincide. Unfortunately, the the FDA approved drugs are still going to be 2023 and beyond, I think, given the phase three trials as they go. But I mean, another two good things happen to gain momentum. For example, in the United States, diagnostic testing is improving. The ELF test was approved in September or so, which in Europe and the rest of the world has been available for some time. And that's a test that has good validation and it's going to begin its marketing soon. I also know that the ProC3 test from Nordic is partnering with a big company to make it automated and available commercially. So that's probably going to be next year. So there are blood tests that can complement the imaging by elastography. So diagnosis is going to improve. And again, what I think is very important is that as the ADA and other diabetes societies get on board, diabetes and obesity is the tip of the iceberg, right? The one that concentrates it. But then the next will be moving down to people with obesity. But the strategy, I think, is to establish a universal screening for the highest risk and then move our way down to more broader and more difficult to grasp groups. We are doing a study now screening 1,050 people, about half with diabetes and half without diabetes, because we don't know what the prevalence in people without diabetes really is in our clinic. So we hope to finish that by the mid of next year and then come up with some numbers to guide 
guide the guidelines moving forward at least. Are you screening them by following your guidelines for FibroScan? Are you, is that the way you're screening these thousand people? Well, it's a little bit of a research approach in which you're doing a FibroScan to everybody, which wouldn't be what we would do in routine practice. But we're also doing Fib4 and a bunch of commercial markers. So when we put all the pieces together, we're going to see how well the Fib4 plus minus FibroScan can work and then how the other tests come complemented. When we put all the pieces together, we will have some sort of a pilot study to later do this at a larger scope. For example, I have worked at the VA for 25 years and they also putting out some guidelines and beginning to implement FIB4. It's a very high risk population because they're older, have a lot of diabetes, a lot of obesity, and a lot of comorbidities. What I see is that at all levels, this is really becoming something of value. And also by the scope of the broad number of different meetings at where they asked me to talk about this, which is not what happened just just recently. Can I just ask, when you do those patients, are you blind doing the tests in the context of, for example, my practice, my lifestyle side, where people just walk in, I can tell who I think needs a fit for or who I think needs thing. Are you going to say, right, we've done a thousand plus fiber scans. How many of these would have had a fib four of X or a fib four of Y and see how because I think if everybody had a fibre scan first you pick up poor liver health and that directs you because it's costed where it is at the moment to make it so expensive in the way of the pathway that actually it's still a serial test whereas it tells us fat, tells us stiffness, it tells us who has problems that we should be looking for rather than waiting on a blood test telling us who we should then be fibre scanning to find out they've got cirrhosis or they've got advanced so is, is there an option? That's a great question. So the big Big debate is how do we screen a large number of people without bankrupting the system, right? Or clogging the system up with fiber scans or other tests like commercial tests. And, and what is the yield? So the resistance, for example, in the past guidelines at 2018 ASLD guidelines, which why I was a member, there was a big divide between those who said, no, let's just do the FIB4 to everybody with diabetes as the highest risk group with type 2 diabetes we're talking, right? So then others said, well, we don't have the evidence or the outcome data. But my point was, if we don't start, we'll never have the outcomes data. It's like colonoscopies. When they start doing colonoscopies, we didn't know if it was really cost effective or not, right? And expensive. So answering your question, at this stage, we're just doing it to anybody who has not had a fiber scan before or, or anybody who has been told beforehand to have a fatty liver. So it's, it's blinded, random, and as unbiased as possible to later say, well, which would be the most cost effective approach overall? Because you should remember that although we are pushing the FIB4, we do it because it's free, because everybody will get a CBC in a year or a liver enzymes once a year, but it's not a great diagnostic test. It's a test that helps rule out a advanced disease, but not very good to pick up cases that are moderate or mild. So I think the greatest value is just beginning to put that little habit in primary care doctors until better tests become available. Yeah, we know that liver fat is not benign. So even without a stiff liver, if we can alter liver fat and keep them on a healthier perspective, that's a cost effective for me, uh, getting somebody off the timeline for NASH, for NAFLD, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. So it's all encompassing rather than just we like to silo. We're, yes, we're the national army. Yes, we're looking at NAFLD here specifically. But if we only take one, we miss the other advantages, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. As I like to say, the fat in the liver is really, uh, or your liver is really your mirror of your metabolic health. So it's your mirror. If you are lean or obese, but have fat in the liver, um, it's just telling you your insulin resistance and unhealthy metabolically. It could be your genes. We can blame our parents as we like to do. Or or it could be poor dietary habits or lack of physical activity. Steatosis is a great marker of future bad things to happen. And again, as you know, Louise, there have been many studies looking at cardiovascular outcomes and they've been a mixed bag because the quality in most is not great. They've used ultrasound, which is not the most sensitive test. They've taken one time point and again, another time point years after. They've used many surrogate markers of cardiovascular disease like intimate 
from a meal thickness, which converted into a meal thickness, which is not great. And when you correct for traditional risk factors like hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes, these differences tend to shrink. But we all agree that having steatosis is something that's going to tell that bad things will happen from you from a cardiovascular endpoint if you live long enough. That all is great. And then my question becomes how we take all this knowledge and important insight and shoehorn it into schedules of people who have no time to bring it in anyway. And Stephen, most eloquently, but other folks have talked on this podcast about how overburdened primary care is and how overburdened really everybody is, but particularly primary care. So given the practicalities of how health systems work, let's stay in the U.S. for a second. How do we take all this great momentum and knowledge and translate it into getting patients treated earlier and better? Can you have any vision for how that actually will work? Primary care doctors and endocrinologists get bashed by the liver doctor saying, oh, guys, you don't do anything. I throw it back to them saying, well, you guys don't even measure an A1C in your patients with NAFLD many times. But also, in a follow-up visit in the United States, we are asked by our division chiefs and higher-ups to see our people with obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, retinopathy, nephropathy, hypertension, dyslipidemia, sleep apnea, low testosterone, and low thyroid in 20 minutes. And those 20 minutes, I need to know how he's doing, gather the history, do a physical exam, reorder all his medicines, order new labs, and write my note. And tell them, by the way, we just found out that you have cirrhosis. So it is a challenge. So I've been giving a lot of thought of this. I think what we have to do is that's why the clinical care pathway tried to make it simple. With a FIT4, which is a fairly imperfect test, but at least it will catch people with F3, F4, with advanced liver disease. And what we are doing in our institution, we are now putting the FIT4 into the electronic medical records of all doctors. And if it's high, it will pop up their window saying your FIT4 is high, consider ordering, you know, and we put the clinical care pathway for them to just order the fiber scan and, and take it from there. And in settings that don't have elastography to do an ELF test or send to the liver doctor. So I think those automatic reminders will be taking advantage of the electronic medical records. The other downside is that endocrinology primary won't get paid a penny more for diagnosing cirrhosis or spending 10 minutes more with their patients. So there's an economic side to that. And not to mention, COVID has really exhausted the emotional and physical energy of all of us in the healthcare profession. So we're really tired. And now we have another wave of Omicron coming. So this is not the best time to ask for more screening for a new disease. Automating, uh, making it simple. We don't have a hemoglobin A1C for NASH, but I think the FIT4 will at least get those with more advanced disease to see their liver doctors. That's a simple test, simple movement that should be embraced broadly. In most settings in the United States have electronic medical records, and it wouldn't be that complicated to do. Of course, I don't have a great answer. I know what you're looking for, but automated things that will take just seconds to order a second test are the way to go. Actually, what I was looking for is an acknowledgement of the idea that it's going to be easier to figure out what people are supposed to do than figure out how to get them to do it. And I think you kind of answered that one by saying, yeah, that's right. We're going to have to work harder on that one. There's no easy answer. You know, how long did it take for people to order routinely lipid testing uh, or to send them to the eye doc? I, when, I, when I'm this old that we started ordering albumin in the urine and still I was reading an article the other day that 30 years years later, still only two thirds of people with diabetes get it all the time every year, at least once. If you achieved your dreams in a single lifetime, you're not dreaming big enough. This is going to take a long time, <laughs> but we got to get started. Finally, Professor Jarn Schottenberg of the University of Mayans will discuss cost effectiveness and the public health agenda in Europe leading to greater focus on maintaining overall patient quality of life. Now we are here with our good friend, Jorn Schottenberg, who I have taken to affectionately and respectfully calling the fifth beetle, which I guess kind of mutilates the surfer metaphor a bit, but the Beach Boys didn't have anything like a fifth Beach Boy. They always had uh, tumult and, and chaos. So we're going to have to go with fifth beetle. Jorn, how are you today? Oh, thank you, Roger. I'm fine. Good to see you, Louise. And you, Jorn. And Louise and Jorn, as you'll see when you see the after picture, are, are dressed in matching black, making my wife a little more offset. Not sure what to make out of that, but I'm not going to worry about it terribly much either. We've just got excellent taste look, for Christmas. You, you both have excellent taste all the time and you like each other, which is a good thing. And, and in fact, the combination of Louise being blonde with, with, the, with the black shirt and yarn being dark with the black shirt, is just, it's really good. 
works. My graphics and artistic directors of fruit and the sleeves really make it. Luis, you have to put the sleeves up when we take the when they take the picture at the end. So someone knows what we're talking about. It's my snow shirt. Know, it's a snow, it's a, it's a snow. So at any rate, we gave Jorn the remarkably broad topic of anything he chooses to cover in the areas of AI or cost effectiveness. AI, because everyone knows it's important. And cost effectiveness in part because we know that cost effectiveness is going to be pivotal to getting fatty liver accepted in the place that it belongs. And that Jeff Lazarus actually mentioned some of Jorn's work as being really helpful to the effort that is going on in Europe and around the world. So Jorn, you know, kind of where, what happened in 21? What do you see in the years ahead? And pick the, it's, it's a big topic. Start wherever you want. Well, yeah, thanks, Roger. I'll also for giving me an opportunity here to think back on 2021. I think it's been an, uh, an amazing year. It's been challenging in many aspects. It's been another year of mostly not being able to to meet in person. And for that reason, every time I come on Nash Tsunami, this feels to me like being able to discuss science and emerging topics in the field with friends and colleagues and peers. So really, a Nash Tsunami has carried me through another year of abstentionism with regards to in-person meetings. So I think this is exceptional. And if you think back to what happened over the year. It's been also an exceptional year for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because we've seen three New England journal papers coming out. That's not a typical thing to happen for one single indication. It shows you the momentum we're seeing here with regards to drug development. Two of those papers, one on the SEMA phase two and one the lanifibrinor phase two, we discussed at length in this podcast. But then the third one talking on the natural history of the disease, and it comes from the NASH CRN and Rune Sanyal is first author on that, detailing endpoints, mostly liver-related endpoints in uh, liver biopsy-defined uh, population being followed for four years and more. So we're learning on relevant endpoints in that population. You know, that brings together many aspects we've been discussing here on the podcast, namely, why is it relevant to study the disease? Will the patient do reach liver-specific endpoints? Uh, how could we do that? And there's a number of MOAs being explored. And if you look back to the failures, it, it follows the same theme, the discussion around what's the best endpoint, why is there so much noise in liver histology? We've seen improvements in NITs with the Alda Furman data, which we thought might translate into benefit if being followed for longer, but still the program was discontinued in the non cirrhotic population. That summarizes many aspects that have been key for me when I think back to 2021. When you ask me to talk about cost-effectiveness analysis, of course, that's another big step here. And a study that we did this year was with many European colleagues together. Vlad Ratsu is the last author. I serve as first author on, on a manuscript that was published in Liver International. And we took out to study the disease burden and the economic impact of diagnosed non-alcoholic steatohepatitis across Europe. So this is a cost of illness analysis that was published published here. And not being a health economist, but if I'd like to have to summarize that paper for you in, in very few words, I think it's important to dissect or what I learned uh, when talking to the health economists that helped us to build that paper is that there are, of course, many different uh, methodologists, uh, methodologies to, to do this and estimates to reach that. And there are, uh, on the one side, economic and well-being costs, and on the other hand, uh, direct medical costs that you can assess. That's a very important aspect that have to be considered here. In the end, the way the approach we took in that paper is that we just sat down and discussed with colleagues and tried to assess how many of the patients we're seeing are actually representative of the overall patient population. We asked the question, how many patients are diagnosed with NASH? Because that would affect the amount that is spent. Bottom line, I think there are two messages that come from that paper. I think across Europe, there's very diverse numbers in terms of how many of the prevalent population are actually being diagnosed. I think in Germany, we agreed that the more advanced disease stages would be more readily diagnosed. And based on the different referral pathways, we're seeing patients in clinics with elevated LFTs, not so much dependent on the disease stage, but many patients are being sent when their uh, LFTs are being elevated. We do see a different patient population compared to the UK, where you do get referrals based on standard referral pathways. And in the end, it turned out that the majority of patients, particularly in the early stages, are probably underdiagnosed. And the, most of the money we spend or most of the economic expenses are made in the end-stage liver disease population. I think those are two very important findings when trying to 
come up with models and cost estimate uh, for this disease. Take a breath. That's a lot. For, for, it's a lot. But the last sentence, or the last, two, the last two couple of paragraphs are a lot. When looking at the cost of diagnosed patients, the cost we see is the cost of end-stage disease. The overall health economic number in the States several years ago when I was doing this stuff more regularly was that about half of all healthcare expenses in the U.S. came in the last six months of life, period. But when you say the disease is underdiagnosed and all the spend is late stage, then I'm going to run around to Louise's side of the table and ask, how much of that money would you guess, underline the word guess, could have been saved with better early stage diagnosis patterns? I'm going to say a lot if we take it to NAFLD and that steatosis isn't benign. So finding early stage poor liver health is, to me, important because it changes the trajectory. If we find somebody in their 20s and we make minor changes there, we don't see, we would hope, the costs. And whilst I appreciate the argument of we need data, we need evidence. We are getting evidence after evidence of the other way around, that when obesity strikes early, we now have children born to parents who are overweight. But those parents on statistically would have been born to children, to parents who were normal weight. So we are moving the framework of everybody's size. I think that's been covered quite a lot. It was covered in the easel meeting earlier on the year, in the keynote speaker. It was covered recently in a Lancet commission by Jeff Lazarus and the team. So I think for me, it's about early opportunity to stop something. Now, and just to pick up on Jean's point on uh, cost effectiveness, I'm going to ask a stupid question here. When I appreciate cost effectiveness, but every life to me is a life saved, whether or not it's early or not. But it only seems to become cost effective when we're talking about one quarter of the population of all of our countries, when we put a very big expensive drug at the end of it. So it's a pharma outcome that requires us to then say it's cost effective not to spend hundreds of thousands on a drug for somebody when that's adding an extra cost into the framework to then make looking for it cost effective. Maybe I'm just simple that but that doesn't really make sense to me to add more expense to then start looking to be cost effective. Surely saving a life at a younger age and we die at liver disease on the average of what 57 in the UK. I'm not too sure what the German statistics are but to me that's more than cost it's societal cost it's working life lost it's it's all of those other costs that we seem to only worry about when we stick a big number because x drug is going to cost x amount we better find it quick <laughs> explain it to me that that's not easily explained and again i'm not a health economist here roger can give his thought maybe on that but the point you're addressing i think is if we spent money on diagnosing fatty liver disease fatty liver disease is the mirror of the unhealthy metabolism it reflects an unhealthy person that's going to develop a metabolic complication. Now, that's not necessarily going to be cirrhosis with cancer or transplant. A cost-effectiveness analysis trying to explore liver endpoints falls short to capture the benefit of that patient. And that brings us to a central aspect of all these analyses is the competing risk. So if the young male with a fatty liver on elastrography will be screened and counseled to avoid his diabetes or to avoid his cardiac or stroke, myocardial cardiac infarction, that's a benefit that needs to be accounted for. And it's not going to be captured when aiming to improve liver health necessarily. This is one aspect. Yes, you can spend money on liver screening. It's easy to detect fatty liver and the benefit is there, but not necessarily for a liver endpoint in the time frame we're looking at. I think that's one point I'd like to make. And, and you know, you made another good point is why do we start to worry about patients with cirrhosis trying to avert or affect their outcome? Well, the the truth is many patients with cirrhosis are already in the clinic, so we do need an answer for these patients. But I'm with you that there should be a societal commitment to improve metabolic health, to talk about education at schools, nutritional education. And that kind of goes the same way that we discussed with Jeff Lazarus on this podcast to implement more broad concept of living healthy where people then can go on to lead a life that supports liver health, I think. You are, and I, th I think both of you make great points. Louise, I'm going to try to answer your question, not because I agree with what I'm about to say, but because I think it's how the world works. Usually, people run health economic analyses when they're trying to justify what they are spending, not justify what they're not spending, or not to get justification not to spend, unless they're trying to justify something easy, and a drug is easy, okay? So if I want to justify the drug, I simply see what it costs to spend on the drug. I get some parameters around where do I think I might be saving money. I ask myself, am I 
by saving enough money. You can't really do an analysis on what's not there with rigor unless you have really solid numbers about the percentage of the population you're evaluating for which it isn't there. So if you take the number that Nash is 5% of the population or the number that Nash is 14% of the population, and we're looking for early stage Nash and can we reduce the rate of heart disease or diabetes or um, other kinds of morbidities and mortalities, you got to know what number you're starting with. And people have a hard time agreeing on those numbers. Therefore, they have a hard time running that analysis. They, they teach you in business school that, you, that folks do what's expect, what's inspected, not what's expected. And therefore, there's a self-fulfilling cycle, which is the things that can be inspected are the things that get valued, whereas the things that have greater value may never be inspected because there's nothing to inspect. And you go back to the comment Jorn made about the liver as, as a mirror of the metabolism. That's non-quantifiable. And every time we quantitate it, we quantitate it in the context of a specific disease disease that occurs when the liver is not acting in balance. So it's easier to look at how do you validate the cost of diabetes than to say, okay, how much of that cost is fatty liver? What happens if I take fatty liver out of play? And, and that's the thinking that we're going to need to do ultimately to get our arms around this, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> My concern of papers like Tracy Simon's work and the adolescent population, biopsy proven naffled in 17-year-olds. One in 15 was dead within 20 years. We do not bring up our children deliberately to see them die young of cardiovascular disease and extra hepatic cancers, which I think were the two biggest causes in that study. And that, that was a fairly robust study from recollection. And that gaining that evidence, it's about when do you therefore say that it is effective to look at uh, population screening in obesity. The high-risk groups, I do appreciate that, yes, one part of me does. I think everybody should, on, a, on the NHS or anywhere, have a baseline complete body review. We OOT'd our car today, and it was a case that we got a full tick over in all of the major components. We don't do that for people. If that starts earlier... It becomes, to my way of thinking, more cost-effective the earlier you start it. But to pick up on Jean's point about education, I recently had communication with somebody who tried that in a school in the US, to be fair, about increasing awareness of nutrition and diet to be told we can't do that. People get eat If we focus on diet and nutrition, people get eating disorders. There was an obstruction at every level. It's not about focusing on nutrition. It's focusing on health. It's focusing on the general. It's not focusing on your particular diet and how you do it's focusing for me on how your body works we'll all choose to do different things in our life and treat with excess it's it's the season of foie <laughs> now we're going to do it but we're going to do it in my well, most of us will do it in moderation and then we'll tailor it back a little bit but for me prevention we're seeing the culmination of years and years and decades of ignoring health until the end or being centric to one particular disease covid is attacking all of our metabolism metabolic diseases and all of those at risk. And I think to outthink a virus that really doesn't think too much but keeps it simple, we have to keep it simple. Let's screen people. Let's look at them as an organ, as a person. Person-centric assessment is probably, for me, where I would like to see things going. I think it's what the Lancet Commission leans to. It's it's multi-morbidity management. It's let's make it person-centric because the spend becomes about the person rather than the silo parts of that person. As Donna said, treat me, the patient, not me, the disease. Very good points, Louise. And uh, just to carry that thought a little further, I've mentioned some heart outcomes, liver specific or stroke, for example. But of course, quality of life, and we've touched on this a number of times, is strongly associated with the disease stage, fibrosis stage, particular end stage, but also inflammatory activity. And there's been a number of meta-analysis linking NAFLD independently of other comorbidities to quality of life. And there is clear evidence that this is affected. Now, that's another difficult part to assess and the benefit to be quantitated. It always comes down to are you using the right tool? Is that tool validated in that respective population? And in health economies, I know that there's a lot of calculations related to loss of productivity or being away from work, which you can then quantitate and, and calculate economic losses. And to me, from what I see from the literature and what I stand from the published analysis, there's a considerate burden in that arena here located. It's not only the physical 
part of being sick, but the loss of quality of life, the inability to care for others. Now, how much of that is strictly related to the liver uh, instead of being obese or diabetes? For the single patient, it doesn't matter. For cost analysis, maybe it's more important to decide where to invest on, you know, what should we improve? It's an important aspect of, of uh, NAFLD. Jorn, as I was listening to Louise and then listening to you, I had two or three thoughts. Let me go back to Louise first. Louise, politics in this country, at least, have become so horribly conflated that what I think happened in the case you talked about was that when your colleague said we should do health training around diet, what the school administrators heard was that the kids were going to decide that we were doing training because there were obese kids in class, and therefore the obese kids would get picked on, and it would turn into a big body-shaming exercise, right? Quite um, possibly. That's the logic I'm driving. And that actually speaks to a lack of visualization about what a curriculum would be. Because if you start the curriculum about the idea of how many of us are jeopardized, the jeopardy is not a function of weight, per se, but it's a function of a whole bunch of things, you can reframe the beginning of the argument and maybe take the stigma out of it, if that's what you know you need to do, instead of throwing up your hands and saying, oh my gosh, parents are on me for everything. It'll just be one more thing. That's thought number one. Your thought number two is that Alina Allen, when we spoke with her last week, mentioned an idea that I'd not seen previously in healthcare, but you see all the time in marketing, which is AI based on secondary database. And specifically, the question was, if we're going to go down a multidisciplinary pathway and start in primary care, given how time is allocated in primary care practices, how can we be confident that we can get a first step that works? And instead of coming back and saying, well, gee, you know, we could determine that one of the tests we have right now is much better than FIB4, what she said was, well, maybe we could uh, go into the databases and analyze for the characteristics, fundamentally turning electronic medical records into a huge AI database, which struck me as brilliant. We've got privacy protections in all these societies that may make it impossible ever to do it. Yes. But if you could, it would address a lot of issues. Uh, and I mentioned that because... You're kind of asking, where do you start also? Absolutely. You raised the important point that those patients are mostly, and I mentioned, not diagnosed. They're probably mostly with primary care physicians. And as uh, you know, colleagues here have highlighted, there's a tremendous pressure on primary care physicians to do everything they can do in those 15 minutes they have for the patient. So I support the idea of using tools to assist potentially, A, the physician, or maybe even the reception handling the patient's appointments in highlighting and flagging out the patient that this is somebody at risk of liver disease. And there's two algorithms that we actually build and use to study. And one is published by now, which is the NASH map algorithm that uses 14 variables to actually identify patients at risk of NAFLD and then could trigger the referral. Now, uh, to be more precise, it's not identifying patients at risk of NAFLD, it's by identifying patients at risk of NASH. So independent of the fibrosis stages, this could be one lean way to flag them for future referral. There's another study that we did build on that, and I think it takes a little different approach in, in terms of that's a retrospective database exploration of the NIDDK and the Optum Electronic Healthcare Records. And it's an algorithm that was built to identify those patients that progressed to cirrhosis within three years of being initially diagnosed. We call that population a fast progressor population. Both algorithms were developed and have good metrics to identify these patients. And there's a clear advantage to run them in the back end of, let's say, primary care healthcare provider or primary care physician's databases, not giving the data out, but keeping it into the office and then making an appointment or referral or flagging up these patients and for once in their lifetime saying, you know, this person should be evaluated for liver disease. Is the lean, is the lean progressor uh, analysis one time? Yeah, uh, that, that, so that, it, that was called fast progressor. It does include the BMI as a risk factor. The algorithm actually pulled from the big Optum electronic healthcare database, 44 features. So it's a complex algorithm, much more than FIB4 could do. But based on the availability of all that data, when such an approach is feasible. Yes, it was built as a one-time assessment to predict someone as either fast or standard progressor. But I agree. And I guess the, the question you're asking, you know, if you rerun that algorithm every time the patient comes and you build information on, on changes of these data points, that's even stronger. My perception when you haven't done that is that you're going to get more precise predictions of the future in these cases. I want to thank you for editing me with a level of intelligence I don't have because that wasn't the question behind my question. I hadn't thought it through nearly that well. 
What you heard today were excerpts of longer episodes, episodes that covered more topics and in greater depth. To hear more, listen for Manal Abdul Malik on December 28th, Yarn Schottenberg on December 29th, and Ken Kuzi on December 30th. Our next full episode with Professors Jeff Lazarus, Global Liver Institute Public Policy Head Andrew Scott, and Dr. Stephen Harrison will drop on Thursday, December 31st. See you then.